In this video, you'll be learning about this topic. So guys, definitely correct me if I'm wrong here. Whereas it sounds like discounted cash flow is a part of evaluation, you also really much focus on a call it Benjamin Graham asset heavy valuation. This is not a software company that has whatever, 20 salespeople and a few people in, a, in one office and no assets. I mean, this is a very asset heavy company and there are any number of precedential transactions for how people value these assets. And I will note, although it is something that we approach with some trepidation, but there have been hundreds of billions of dollars raised in private infrastructure funds. Insurance companies need yield. And there are these vehicles that are being raised by either it's Blackstone or someone like Macquarie or Brookfield, for example, that have whatever, 10, 20, 30 billion dollars in money that goes physical infrastructure. And what does level three have is some of the most envious fiber infrastructure assets in the entire world. And so we're not going to put a lot of credence in the idea that someone's going to pay some insane multiple for level three. But our point is that there are a lot, there's a lot of demand for certain assets. So this is our sum of the parts analysis, which is in a way it's a, what would someone else pay for just the assets of this company? What does that compare to the stock price? And so that's how we get those numbers. But I'll just, you know, I was just playing around with our DCF a little bit and we put a nine and a half percent whack, which I think is with the 30-year treasury is at 1.67 and 9.5% whack is a very, very, very conservative number. We're getting, even with 0% perpetual growth and then a perpetual decline in the voice business, as Eugene said, you're still getting high teens. I think that's a very conservative valuation and you have a $9 stock. So it's just like any way you look at it, the stock is undervalued. So then the question is, what are we missing or what is the market missing? And our point one, the market does very poorly with things that are shrinking. Shrink to grow is not something the market handles well. And the market is also not good with a or not good at valuing a growing cash flow generative asset within a shrinking total top line attached to a shrinking business. That's why there are spins and that's why there are asset sales that can, you know, kind of highlight value. So to some extent, there is a catalyst in our future we believe. And that's where you're going to, the, some of the value that we're discussing is going to be surfaced, but it's going to take some patience. I mentioned that we have this hypothesis that the company's in the middle of splitting these two companies up and it's messy. This was a messy merger. There are a lot of physical assets. There are little things like you have to figure out transfer pricing in between, if you sell your fiber assets. If the company split, the split off company still using the fiber assets, you have to figure out transfer pricing. And so it's, I'm not saying it's simple, but given this is a company that people know, Seattle Seahawks Stadium is a CenturyLink field, right? And so this is a company people know. We have a CEO who is highly incentivized to create value for shareholders, who's done it before. And one more point, if you go to their June 2020 presentation, for the first time we'd ever seen, they put in a slide that said, hey, we know we have a $10 stock, but here are some appropriate multiples we have for our two businesses. And so they did exactly what Eugene did. They split level three and they split the legacy century link. And they said, hey, so you have $3 billion in, re in EBITDA here at, at level three. You have $6 billion in EBITDA at century link. Let's put just conservative multiples on those, illustrative of what this company should be, could be worth. And so this is a company that had a $10 stock that was saying we think we're worth 24 to 35. I mean, it, these are numbers that you almost don't put out there because, because people think that's so crazy. If you think of a long-term return of the stock market over 200 years is like 6 to 7% per year, and you're talking about a single security that could have three times upside based on the company's valuation, you don't see that that often. And so we rack our brains to figure out what other people are thinking. We understand what we think the market misses here. And so now we're patiently waiting for a good capital allocator who has a history of creating value for shareholders to create the catalyst that makes this a very, very lucrative investment for us and our investors. And it sounds to me like the catalyst you have in mind is some kind of special situation where they might break apart the merger and spin off one, one part of the assets. Is that correct? Some kind of value creating structure, whether they, Eugene mentioned the Altice sale of their assets, they actually only sold 50%. So Morgan Stanley Infrastructure Fund bought 50% of Altice's um, fiber assets. And Altice has really attractive assets in New York City. But you know, we talked to the company, this is Lumen, and we asked them, so was there anything unique about Altice's assets? And, he, and they said, you know what, even if we own those assets, we wouldn't even add to what we own in New York City. 
I mean, it's just, and that, that went off almost 15 times EBITDA. They don't even have to monetize all the fiber assets. They could do half. They could split the companies in two. They could sell the consumer business, which was, was something that's been floated. So a private equity company would buy it for a low multiple, lever it up, and then they get the return. So there are a number of different ways that they could do this. The question is, are they going to do it? And what's holding them back? And our answer to the second question is, it's just time, right? In the middle of COVID, you're not going to sell physical assets. People couldn't even visit the assets until very recently. So anything that was happening in January has been put on hold. But our sense is that the rebranding is just the first sign, getting rid of the CenturyLink name, calling this company Lumen, saying that you're more of a tech company, the writing's on the wall, this is going to happen. And then the question is, what is it worth? What is someone willing to pay for it? And that's you know kind of what we are, as we're sitting here clipping a 10% coupon, we're hoping that the numbers are anywhere near what our research would suggest. So the last thing I like to do after I found something that I think is undervalued is look at the momentum. Before finally buying something, I track the momentum, which you can do at theinvestorspodcast.com. We have the TIP finance tool with a great momentum feature. Basically, what it's doing is it's tracking the price volatility historically and finding the range, the normalized range, and seeing if it's training inside or outside of that range. When I look at that indicator on our website, it's red, right? So I typically wait to see if that price momentum changes into a green indicator showing positive price movement. The reason I do that is mainly because with value investing, oftentimes you can find something like a value trap or what's also known as a falling knife, where the market could potentially just continue to discount and discount and depress the stock price indefinitely. We really don't know when that catalyst you mentioned is going to come along. So it's wise to consider the price momentum. But I think this is pretty unique because you do point out that while you're waiting, you are collecting a 10% dividend yield. And I think that's... um, pretty uncommon and something to kind of potentially make you a little bit more patient as you hold the stock and something to consider. Is that anything... I'm just curious about price momentum. Is that something you've ever factored into your own investing strategy? It's not something we consider. I mean, we're looking at... We run a concentrated portfolio of securities and we're focused on the business value and people. And when we see large margin of safeties, we act with conviction. Are there opportunities? I mean, the things you're saying are absolutely correct. I might just point out here that when you're investing in situations where there's a special situation or where there's a catalyst, you may get terribly negative price momentum until one day it goes the other way. So there are a million different ways. And at that point, you're too late. (laughs) Yeah, no, at that point, you're too late. If there was a transaction here that valued the consumer at seven times EBITDA, which is where uh, you know Cincinnati Bell went out, which is a, maybe had some slightly better assets in the consumer business at CenturyLink, but still se- a seven times multiple would be a hugely attractive multiple for the CenturyLink business, and then you you'd be left with the we think a really good level three asset. So there is a risk towards just waiting for things to get better because listen, within financial markets, there's a pendulum that that swings between greed and fear. Right now, there's a lot of fear when associated with the CenturyLink and level three and Lumen. And so the question is, is that founded or unfounded? Our sense is that even a slight shift in that pendulum going back a little bit towards greed could still be very much on the fearful side. But given the leverage, given the degree of undervaluation, just a slight change in what people think about this could be enormously accretive for shareholders. So I understand what you're talking about. It's just not something that we really incorporate in our analysis. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below. 